how can projects, programmes and policies be made more transformative? So that's the question that we're here to look at today. Um, I'm Vicky Shaw, I'm a programme director at the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium, or TIPSI, and I'll be joined today by three TIPSI colleagues, that's um, Carla, Alviel Palavicino and Johan Schott from Utrecht University and Viposhi Kosh from Sprue at the University of Sussex. And together they'll be looking at how we can address these challenges that are asking us for deep changes in our economies and societies and using the transformative outcomes that have been developed by the consortium since its inception a few years ago. So I'd like to welcome everyone who's joined here today. Uh, this is part of our open learning series, which aims to connect people who are working on transformative policy approaches all around the world. So it was really great to see such diversity in terms of registrations for this event. We had bookings from many countries, I think more than 25, and lots of different roles represented. We have researchers, people working in programme design, monitoring and evaluation, analysis, local government, and, and many more. But we're all here with a common purpose. So we're all here because we're interested in changing the system in some way. And we want measures to gauge whether or not that change is happening. So another characteristic of these open events is that we have people with quite different levels of experience with the tipsy concepts. Um, some of you will be completely new to these, while others, and I know, for example, some of our members from South Africa may be here, are working with them already in real depth. So this leads to interesting interactions, but it also needs a bit of patience from participants. So please bear with us in terms of where the content is pitched at. So I'll quickly run through the plan for today. We have two hours together. We will start with a short introduction from Johan and a quick challenge in the chat. And then we'll have a connecting phase to meet some of the other participants in very small groups. Then Biposhi will introduce the transformative outcomes in more depth, and then we will close the first part with a question and answer session, and we'll have a short break, probably just five or ten minutes. And then after the break, Carla will introduce a taster activity in larger groups. And in that activity, you'll learn how you might use a particular outcome in your work. So this will be something new that's not in the literature. So finally, before I hand over to Johan, we do have a lot of material on the transformative outcomes and on the dynamics of transition on the TIPSI website. So we want this to be a space where people can talk about what these concepts actually mean to them in practice and, and about how this might help to shape your thinking, whatever you're doing. So we will be recording the plenaries, but not the breakout groups. So please bear that in mind in terms of confidentiality and treat discussions in those forums as confidential unless you're advised otherwise. Um, and then finally, just given the breadth of experience, we just want to emphasize that we value everything that you're bringing in today. And um, we're looking forward to working with curiosity and, and finding out and learning more from one another. So thanks for that. And I'll hand over to you, Johan. Johan is um, one of the, founders of TIPSI and based at the Utrecht University Centre for Global Challenges. Thanks. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, all the participants, for, for joining. Uh, I have a very brief introduction, which is about why should we focus on transformative outcomes. So what is the rationale for all of this? Um, for this, we have to start at considering the challenges that we are facing, either expressed in the SDGs or in another way. Uh, but it's very clear, I think, for many people now that we need to redirect the economy and society. So business as usual is not sufficient. And uh, so we talk about system change. And in TIPSI, when we talk about system change, we talk about social technical system change. So social technical systems are the systems which provision basic needs like energy, mobility, healthcare, communication, water, uh, and so on. 
So the idea is that we have systems uh, with elements like regulations, uh, science and technology, uh, markets, industry strategies, cultural elements that are aligned, that organize the systems for the provisioning of basic needs. So we need new energy systems, new healthcare systems, new water systems to put in place. Um, and there's also agreement within TIPSI uh, about this across the members and beyond TIPSI. Yet it's very difficult to implement system change in practice. So why is this the case? Because if you look at uh, some of the funders we work with, and this include private funders, uh, then you can see that they invest or fund certain type of projects or programs that have a huge sustainability promise, but they end up quite conservative. So the results is not so transformative. Now, why is this the case? Well, there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, in the end, it's often more easy to fund projects with a clear economic promise or in private terms, return on investment. These projects also tend to be less risky. What we call regime actors, so actors who represent current systems, dominant practices, they often are dominant and they want to stay close to the current system. So they focus on system optimization. Uh, so what is system optimization? For example, if you think about the food system, uh, precision agriculture is more of a system optimization, while organic agriculture would be more of a system change. And why is it more of a system change? Because there are more dimensions of the system that need change. And also because the change goes deeper, it affects the underlying principles, not just what we call the phenotype or uh, the system elements, but also the underlying rules that actors use to build these systems. But also for system optimization solutions, the impact is often clearer and more direct. So system optimization, precision agriculture, does, uh, has positive impacts and you can make them visible. And if you make funding decisions, that's nice. So if you invest in system chains, that's often far more difficult. So it's higher risk and the impacts that you will make are perhaps more uncertain. Uh, so why would you do that? Well, the answer is that uh, we have to come back to the beginning the belief that we do need new systems to be put in place to address the global challenges in a deep and meaningful way. So in Tipsy, we have been experimenting with system change, how to do this. And we have developed this formative evaluation method with transformative outcomes uh, in which we use a theory of change. So it basically means that for a project or a program, we try to find out how what type of activities will lead to what type of outputs and what type of outcomes that then will lead to certain impacts. But the crucial thing is that we look at outcomes, transformative outcomes. Uh, and this places funders in a specific position because uh, public funders often are called upon to overcome market failure. So private funders are not stepping in, are not investing in certain solutions because it's too risky or there's not enough return on investment so public investors need to step in so they have to overcome market failure or it is argued that they have to overcome what's called system failure because there's no links between industry and uh, business sorry industry and universities it's the task of the government to build these links. There's not, there's not enough entrepreneurship in society. It's the task of the government to stimulate entrepreneurship. For example, in uh, transformative innovation policy, the idea is that the role of the government is to overcome transformational failure. So the idea is that many solutions put forward by the private sector are not transformative enough. So the role 
of the public funder is to make them more transformative. And the question is how to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. And, and that question um, it is a, a good prompt for us really to, to start asking you some questions um, in the audience. So what we'd like to try is uh, what I think is called a waterfall chat. So we will ask you a question. We'd like you to formulate a response and put it in the chat, but don't press enter. Don't share your response until, until we're ready. So the question we're going to ask you, and I think Carla, um, you've kindly offered to paste this into the chat, is which one thing would you prioritise in your work to promote systems transformation? It may not be in your work, actually. It may be in, in your home life. But which one thing would you prioritise to promote systems transformation? So we'll just give you a minute um, to formulate an answer. And then in a minute, I will say go and we can see what people have put in the chat. Take a few moments. Okay, so we've had a minute and um, I'll count down. So five, four, three, two, one, and please enter your answer in the chat. Fantastic, thank you. So there's some food for thought as we start off the session today on what we might want to be looking at for transformation. And there are some really interesting contributions there from mindsets um, to industry engagement, education. Thank you. So building on that, we're now gonna go into a connecting phase. Now, one key action towards transformation is building a network. And this is something that we're learning as we explore um, transformative innovation policy and the transformative outcomes. So not just about transferring knowledge, but about learning across communities. So the purpose of this next exercise is in that spirit. Um, it's purely to start to support learning and networking between different communities around the world. So we're going to go into breakout rooms for 12 minutes, and there'll be very small breakout groups of, of just three, maybe two or four people. And, and in those breakout rooms, we're just going to ask you to chat to the person that you get put with or people that you get put with and um, talk about who you are and what you do and talk about what transformations are you contributing to or aspiring towards um, you know what's your role in, in this so this question is deliberately open it might include new frameworks or ways of conceptualizing ideas about transformation it's not constrained to professional identities or projects or programs so really thinking quite broadly about what kind of transformations you might be contributing to. And bear with me, I'm not sure if Carla has been able to pop those questions in the chat for us. Yeah. So we'll go into the breakout rooms now and that will be just for 12 minutes. Okay, thanks for doing that. Um, <laughs> I hope it wasn't too chaotic in some of the rooms. We had some people joining and leaving at the same time, but it's nice to see people have had the chance to turn cameras on and connect. So um, now we've made a start on that, I'd like to introduce Bipati Ghosh from Spru, who is going to talk through um, the transformative outcomes in more detail in the context of um, transition dynamics. So over to you Bipati, and please feel free to leave your cameras on um, or turn them off, whatever suits for the next 15 minutes. Sorry. Thank you, thanks Vicky. Um, can you, I, I hope you can see my screen and now full screen, correct? Yes. 
Yes, yes we can see your screen. And, and before you start, Prakashi, maybe I'll just say to the group, rather than putting it in the chat, um, that if people have questions to Johan or Prakashi, we'll take these at the end of the presentation. So you can write them in the chat and we will pick some out to discuss in more depth after the presentation. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Vicky, and thanks everyone for joining us today. And what I'll do today is obviously I will follow what Johan um, said um, about the rationale of, uh, of us creating this um, framework of transformative outcomes. But I'll go a bit uh, more into the theory or the science behind, um, behind this particular framework. So some of you are, um, are um, perhaps fa familiar with, uh, with the theory and also um, this particular framework, but I will go into the basics. So please bear with me. Um, so this is basically um, a framework that we have co-created uh, in the consortium uh, for the last four, four years uh, between academics and policymakers um, uh, within the TIP consortium. So just to introduce um, where this transformative outcomes um, come from, and Johan has already sort of given you a hint. So, so the theory comes from, um, from the literature of socio-technical transitions. And what transitions theory says is that it is about a theory of socio-technical system change. So we build on this very specific theory of change uh, where we see, um, where we study a multi-level interaction between three levels. So the niche level, the regime level, and the landscape level. So what is most important to, to see here is that we have a socio-technical landscape, which is the current system that Johan was describing. Um, so our socio-technical systems are comprised of, um, of a stable configuration of rules. And this is what we call a social, what we call a socio-technical regime. So, so here you can see that a socio-technical regime is this specific configuration of rules. And these rules are, by the way, is not just regulations put in place, but these are more fundamental beliefs, values, um, practices, routines that guide actions. Um, so these rules, these configurations of rules are manifested in socio-technical systems that we, that we use today. So just to give you an example of um, say a car-based mobility system, um, we have not just the car, which is the technology, the, uh, the, the artifact, but also the policies around car-based mobility, the industry, the culture of car-based mobility um, and markets and consumers. So these are all the different dimensions that, um, that come together, that, that aligns together to form this socio-technical system. So what we say in this multi-level perspective um, theory of change is that this, so this particular socio-technical system, when we need to change this socio-technical system, we need interventions from niches. So niches are uh, basically spaces where alternative innovations emerge. And these alternative innovations are also um, a particular configuration of rules, so alternative rules, but these are not so stable yet. So, um, so these alternative configuration of rules um, then um, interact with the stable configuration of rules, which is the regime. And uh, even and over time, it, um, it changes the regime uh, or it, it substitutes the regime, it reorients or reconfigures the regime. Uh, and that's what you see in the figure on your left as the green uh, sort of new, the emergence of a new socio-technical regime from the blue old socio-technical regime. And in this particular uh, interaction, the importance of landscape, um, so the, the landscape pressures are really important. So landscape pressures are um, rather the exogenous pressures um, or the, the sort of macro level, um, uh, macro level dynamics. Um, and an example of that would be climate change, or even the COVID-19 pandemic that is, um, that is influencing the current um, socio-technical systems uh, to sort of hollow out or open up and, and, to, and, and it's creating this window of opportunity for the niche alternative innovations to, um, to, to come in and replace the old, uh, old socio-technical regime. 
So this is basically the fundamental sort of theory of systemic change that we that we use as a basis of our um, our framework. And obviously, as you can understand, this is a very complex process. So what makes this process a very complex one is uh, the multiplicity of the, all the multiple sociotech multiple system dimensions. So these different dimensions of the system um, are, are aligned with one another, and that gives the system a degree of stability. So indeed, changing this system is incredibly complex because you need to sort of de-align and realign these multiple systemic dimensions. And at the same time, this process is a multi-actor process. So we, in a, in a system change, it's not one actor doesn't dominate um, this process, it's a multi-actor process, and that is also very, this, that is also non-linear. So there is not one linear way of changing this system. And there is a degree of uncertainty attached to this process. So uh, what also makes this process complex is that this process is about creating novelty in the niches, as I, um, as I said, um, but it's also about deliberate, deliberate decline and destabilizing the dominant regime. So what you can see on the figure on your right, it's a simultaneous process of building the niches from the bottom up, at the same time, opening up and unlocking the regimes that you can see by the, by the red curve um, uh, that starts on the top, um, top left and ends on the bottom uh, right. So to navigate this complexity, what is really important, and some of you wrote this in the chat, um, I noticed, is to build trust and to create uh, some consensus by sustaining collaboration. So that's why it's really important uh, for us um, in the TIP consortium, it's really important to, to sort of sustain collaborations um, in, within academia, but also across academia and practice. And what is important in this very complex process of systemic change is this awareness um, of the path that is chosen and the path that is not chosen. So um, it, since this is a multi-actor process, um, uh, there are multiple, there are also multiple transition pathways. So, um, so, so directionality of who drives the transition or who is dominating the transition process uh, creates, a, a sets a directionality and directionality is, um, is what we call the awareness and deliberation is this awareness and deliberation about the paths that are not chosen and what could be the consequences of the un, un, um, not chosen paths. Um, so just to go into a bit more details about uh, niche breakthrough. So promoting the emergence of new alternatives um, is really key to this systemic transformation process. So when we talk about niches, niches are um, the protective spaces where alternatives can emerge. And these alternatives need to be shielded from the pressure from the incumbent actors, incumbent institutions, and the social structures, because these are not yet stable rules. These, are, um, these, are, um, these alternatives are often created through experimentation by niche actors um, who are often experimenting with alternative new set of, of novelties, but also alternative new set of rules. So niche innovations are not just alternative technologies, but also alternative business models or new social innovations or practices. Um, so uh, it's, so we, what we want to emphasize is that it's not just about technological innovation, but what, what we are trying to nurture in the niches, what we, what we nurture in the niches is, um, is, also, is socio-technical innovation. So, it's, a so it's, it's technologies, but also social innovations, as well as business model innovations, as well as innovations in new social and cultural practices. And the way policies can support uh, this sort of development of strategic niches, um, that can drive change um, in, a, in a system towards a more sustainable and equitable direction. So there comes the importance of, of uh, directionality again. So how, uh, to how you, what kind of policies you develop to support what kind of niches uh, to, to develop, what, what kind of strategic niches to support uh, through policy is really a decision that drives um, change in the systems and that determines whether this systemic change would be sustainable and equitable. 
So there are many ways of, um, of nurturing niches and these are um, and we talk about shielding so these are some of the first four transformative outcomes that you can see in the picture so we talk about shielding um, it's about networking it's about broad and deep networking it's also about broad and deep learning and it's also about navigating expectations so um, it's about creating and navigating new set of visions across the different systemic dimensions. So I'll not go into the details of each of the transformative outcomes, but I'm, I'm introducing them and in the breakout rooms, we will have more opportunity to discuss uh, some of these transformative outcomes in more detail. So while it's really important to create uh, this sort of uh, niche protective space and to nurture niche uh, socio-technical innovations, create and, uh, and identify breakthrough innovations, it's not enough. So how do we then expand and mainstream these niche socio-technical innovations? How do we ensure that these innovations really can transform the old regime into a new, um, new, newly transformed regime? So there are many ways of expanding a niche, um, either within a local context or in a global context. So there are, again, different ways we, um, we um, see we can uh, mainstream the, uh, a particular niche. So more alignment between different dimensions of a niche system really allows emergence of a new regime. So here you can see on the figure on your right, there is a way to upscale a niche. One way to mainstream is to upscale a niche, but there are also ways you can replicate a niche in a different uh, local context. You can search, circulate certain aspect of a particular niche in a different context. And you can also institutionalize a niche. And institutionalizing a niche is about formalizing some of the informal rules and making the alignment between the different rules, different newly emerged rules, uh, more formal and institutionalize it as uh, as to become as to make it um, make it more stabilized and part of the newly emerging regime. And in this particular process, uh, this particular macro process, the important role. Um, uh, one of the important roles is played by intermediary organizations. So Johan also mentioned, and I, I, uh, I did, um, well, so there are many actors in the transition. Um, so the, it's a multi-act, in a multi-actor process, uh, you have the niche actors, you have the regime actors, but you also have the intermediary actors who are, um, who are rather bridging um, the, the gap between uh, niche actors and regime actors. And th these, niche, these intermediary organizations play a very important role in mainstreaming, um, mainstreaming uh, the niche uh, innovations. And finally, a third macro sort of process within which you can see um, uh, the final four transformative outcomes is about unlocking regimes. So what we say here is, and this is this is where it, it's really important to understand the the multi level, the dynamic process of systemic change is that it's not it's not um, enough to create niches. Unlocking regimes is equally and as as important as creating niches. So transitions are practically impossible without incumbent regimes opening up and creating a space for. Um, for new and for new alternatives um, to to reconfigure uh, or or to uh, or to uh, replace uh, the existing regime, so regimes can be destabilized through many different policies like phase out policies, but that's just one way of doing it. So there are so that's why we emphasize on the word unlocking because it's not just uh, always about destabilizing regime. So destabilizing regime is one transformative outcome, but there can be other ways of unlocking and opening up the regime. And that could be through unlearning among the, um, among the regime actors, through deep learning among the regime actors. Um, so for example, regime transformation requires, can, um, can be done through abandoning certain existing beliefs, um, values and practices, and and when regime actors really embrace the new beliefs and practices. So that's one way of um, also transforming regime. And it also requires empowering niche actors to work within the regime. So, so the outcome of strengthening niche regime interaction is all about niche actors working within the regime and introducing practices to transform it. 
So, so there are also multiple ways in which, um, or multiple transformative outcomes through which to unlock and open up the regimes. Um, so these are the sort of 12 transformative outcomes across um, the three macro processes that I um, just um, described. And so this is, these are the outcomes that could drive, that could enable um, transformative innovation policy action. And one thing that we always emphasize is that it's not about um, one particular group of actor steering um, or, or enabling or directing the direction of change. It's about coordinating, it's about navigating, um, navigating the change process. And so we are all, um, all of us in this particular uh, event are part of the system. So we all have different roles to play in the system. So the question is, how do we actually, um, how do we actually influence um, and how do we actually put in our efforts to, to make the systems that we work in much more transformative? So a final note about transformative outcomes and how do you actually use, how do you actually mobilize this particular framework of 12 transformative outcomes to accelerate transition in your particular context. So what we say about transformative outcomes is that they are leverage points for urgent actions to overcome transformational failures. So these are some of the points that you can see that you can use to, uh, that you can leverage on um, to, to, uh, to arrange, to do your, to uh, coordinate your action within your context and overcome failures. So these are not necessarily, these are not indicators or tools by themselves. These are rather a set of conditions that can help policies, that can help make policies more transformative. So you can use them as conditions. You can also create indicators of each of the transformative outcomes according to your particular local contextual needs. So transformative outcomes help orient uh, the effort of practitioners to influence transformation in entire socio-technical systems. So it's not just about changing one dimension. It's not just about changing the market. It's not just about changing the policy, not just about changing the technology. It's about influencing transformation in the entire uh, socio-technical system. And it also helps, um, it can be used as a practical guide for monitoring evaluation and learning in policy. And that's what Johan was um, referring to as formative evaluation. So in, in the consortium, we do monitoring evaluation and learning using these transformative outcomes as practical guides through which you, you can uh, be aware of the choices that you make, and the directionality of your, um, of your action um, that um, along the process of transformation that you do in your work. So that's a very quick overview and quick sort of um, uh, guide, a quick sort of introduction to the theory behind the transformative outcomes. And if you have any questions, um, please uh, feel free to ask. And these are our um, Twitter handles, or you can always connect through Twitter. And this is the reference to the paper. You can always go back to the paper for more details. Thank you. Thank you, Vipashi. And the paper is on the Tipsy website, and Vipashi is one of the co-authors on that paper, along with Matthias, um, Paula, Johan, others from Tipsy. Um, so that was just a taster. We, if you'd like to learn more about the transformative outcomes and go deeper into the theory, we have that, but this is a chance to perhaps discuss a little bit more and to answer questions. Now, we've had a few questions in the chat. And I wonder if I could put the first one um, to Johan so I can give the posh a little bit of a break. Um, and we have a question, I think it's from Rodrigo, about the differences between learning and de-learning or unlearning. Um, Rodrigo, would you like to elaborate on that? Or we can just put that straight to Johan. Let's go to straight to Johan. Any comments on learning? Okay, so uh, when we talk about learning, it's first of all important to think about type of learnings, type of learning. Uh, so we talk about first order and second order learning or deep learning. So uh, first, first order learning is about learning to optimize how to do things better, how to improve 
which is certainly important and helpful. And here we also have to think not only need, do we need to learn about technology, which is, for example, often expressed in a learning curve, but also about user needs, about regulatory requirements, institutional conditions. So the learning needs to be broad uh, and deep. And deep learning or uh, second order learning is about questioning our assumptions. So for example, if your assumption is that the um, mobility system would always have to rely on some type of car, whether electric or not, or even solar, that's an assumption you may want to explore or, or an assumption that public transportation would never be sufficiently uh, developed for your mobility needs. Um, so second order learning is, is, is asking deeper questions. De-learning means that uh, uh, it relates to the second order learning uh, because we also have to, we have many uh, ideas and assumptions that may not hold or we may not want to cling to. Uh, so we want to reflect about them. And sometimes you need an active process in place of de-learning. Uh, this can be done also through asking other people to do certain things. For example, I remember when I worked with uh, strategic uh, developments of uh, Volkswagen, they said that they would never ask their current marketing department to, to market electrical vehicles because they would not be able to do that. Uh, so they need to hire new people. Okay, sounds like that answers your question. Thank you. Um, well, we have a question from Andrea to get to, but first of all, um, Soren, would you like to ask the question live or should I read it from, from the chat? Sure, I'll, I'll be happy to. Um, this is Soren from um, UNDP. Um, really like the paper and, and I like the sort of, uh, you know, these different kind of uh, levels and, and uh, kind of aspects of, of how the change happens. And I'd be curious, given I'm sort of new to, to this field, at least on the academic side, to learn a bit about, like, are there any critiques advanced of this particular, like, theory of, of systems change and, um, or whatever it's most uh, appropriate to call it? Um, are there any rival kind of theories of how change happens, different aspects of, of the theory where you feel things are less sort of evolved or not as, as strong in it, uh, as uh, an evidence base as, as um, other aspects? I'm just sort of curious as to, yeah, your take on that. Thank you. That's, that's a really good question. Um, Bipashi or Johan, any preferences to who'd like to have a go at answering that? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, um, I mean, I can start and then Johan can complement maybe. Um, so uh, socio-technical transitions field and this particular framework of multi-level perspective, um, it's being experimented with and applied in um, different contexts and it's being, it's still under development. And I would say that it's um, it's a popular framework, but at the same time, it has received many critiques and it has evolved over time, over the last um, decade or so. So we have tried to sort of use this theory in multiple contexts, um, taking along the criticisms of whether we can actually see these, some of these concepts of niche regime landscape um, in different contexts. Does it actually, is it actually relevant in, um, in different geographical and cultural context, how do we actually then um, see the boundaries of a system? Uh, so there are many way, many critiques, I would say, and there are many sort of, uh, there were many opportunities to actually improve this theory and to actually make this theory uh, much more context relevant. So, and indeed, I mean, in terms of rival theories, I'm not, so there are theories that I would say complements um, the multi-level perspective. So, for example, um, 
uh, when we talk about um, these uh, systems, socio-technical systems, social practices play a very important role. So we, we try to sort of incorporate social practice, some aspects of social practice theory within the system change theory. So there are many theories I would say that has contributed to the improvement of, uh, or, or, or to make this particular dynamics much more rich, much more um, context relevant. Uh, but indeed, this is a very specific theory of change, uh, which takes a, takes a very specific, um, which has a very specific take on um, on on this uh, definition of socio technical system and how exactly it changes. Uh, um, so it does um, does have a very specific uh, sort of way of understanding societal change, um, and I would stop by that. Maybe Johan has something to add. Anything to add, Johan? Any rivals? Well, there's many rivals. You know, there's theories that focus on power. There's theories that focus on ideology. You know, so what is causing change? Uh, um, this theory has a very specific understanding, as BBC said, of this. So because it uh, argues that these systems are built by people driven by rules. Uh, so they are structured, the action is structured by these rules and these rules are collective and embedded in the systems and therefore it's very difficult to change. So social practice theory, for example, has a very different understanding what drives people. Uh, or economic theories certainly have very different understandings. Uh, so in that sense, yes, there are many rival theories, uh, uh, but uh, I think for system change, of course, I'm a promoter of this theory. I think this is a, a theory that uh, not only has theoretical value, but also practical value. So you can work with it in practice. And with, for me, that's an important criterion for a good theory. It needs to be actionable. Great, super useful, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so let's move on to a question from Andrea about um, how you might go about promoting collaboration between different actors, given that they often represent quite different interests. So maybe I could pick on Johan first to have a go at that one. Well, we first have to recognize that transition theory assumes conflict and a specific type of conflict, uh, a conflict between regime actors and niche actors. So it assumes that there are certain actors who will cling to dominant practice, and not only because it's their interest, but be also because they believe in it and they value it. While other actors, niche actors, may value other practices. And here we can have a variety and this variety can be quite deep in a sense that people really are driven by other values. Uh, so what we try to do in transition work is to let these people speak to each other at first, articulate their differences, and then see whether we can find common, common ground uh, with the kind of understanding of divided we stand, so we don't have to agree on everything, but we can still perhaps find a path forwards. Uh, this is not always possible. Uh, so therefore, uh, the whole theory is built on the idea of niches so that you can have specific domains or application areas where you build a coalition of the willing, not in warlike terms, but in peaceful terms, people who are interested in bringing the change forward. So can I just ask you to elaborate, Johan, when you talk about um, getting people to speak to each other, I mean, what might that look like in practice for people who might be newer to these transformative outcomes? What, what might that look like? Well, it looks like any other conversation, you know, mm -hmm. that you, <laughs> uh, uh, for example, in the, uh, we run a uh, panel with investors. And there we, the conversation is first about the future. 
So can we agree on, well, we first talked about the challenges. Can we talk about the challenges we need to address? And then can we talk about the futures? And then it means that we pluralize the futures because actors have different views of desired futures, uh, but there is still some common ground. And then you can ask questions about how do we get there? And what would be good investments to get there? And here again, you can have differentiation but you can also have some common ground. Uh, it's like in any change process. The, the difference with the transition uh, theory is that it does say, let's start with building a niche of actors interested in pushing something forward. Uh, and of course you want this niche to be as strong as possible. So it needs to connect at some point to regime actors, because their regime actors have a lot of resources. And the question is how to do this. Uh, it also needs to uh, mobilize other actors, you know, other niche actors or uh, within the niche actors, uh, develop learning. Uh, so collaborations are uh, very important, but for me, the important thing is to, uh, to understand on the one hand that there are really genuinely different ways of seeing the world and that you need to respect them. But secondly, it doesn't mean you can do nothing. That you, you know, we are divided and there's no, there's no path forward possible. So you can do both, acknowledge the conflict and the differences while still carving out the space for moving forward. Thank you. Thanks for going further on that one. So um, and the next question, maybe I could pose to Biposhki, if that's OK. And that's a question from Imogen about the role of private actors. Um, and do they play a greater role in destabilizing regimes or building up niches? And, you know, what kind of role might they play, in your opinion? Um, yes, so that's a very important question. And uh, the deep transition project that Johan was referring, referring to, we do work with um, quite a few private actors, private investors. So in my opinion, I feel that the role of private actors can vary. So just like we, so in our theory of change, we make the distinction between regime actors and niche actors. And I believe that private actors, uh, private businesses and industries can be regime actors. Um, there can be businesses who are holding on um, and, and uh, locked into a particular regime. And there are also private investors, uh, there are also industry actors who are much more open to change, who are always experimenting, who are uh, maybe looking for, uh, who are in, investing in, in alternative business models, who are uh, perhaps, we work with impact investors, for example. So there are many different ways, even private actors can be niche players. So, so I, I feel that private actors can play both roles and depending on where they are, um, uh, where they are, what kind of strategic action they are prioritizing, what are their sort of visions um, and what visions do they, do they use, what perceptions of the landscape pressure do they have uh, really determine um, how they are acting or to what direction they want to act, whether they want to see the existing regime um, uh, suitable for, uh, for responding to the landscape pressures or whether they see that the existing regime is uh, not suitable and they realize themselves that, um, uh, that, that there is a change coming and there is, a, there is important, the importance of investing in change. So, so I feel that they, they play a role in both destabilizing regime as well as in building niches. Um, depending on their perception of how the landscape will affect their existing businesses and the industry. Thank you, Bupashi. Would you like to add anything further on that, Johan? No, not really. No. So um, that was the last question from the chat. Um, would anyone like to pose any further questions before we go into break? Now's the time to do it if you want to pop anything in the chat or you can also just come into the conversation if we pause for a moment.
Okay, well, well, thank you for those questions. So what we'll do now is take a short break and then we're going to go into the second part of the session where we will zoom into one of the transformative outcomes. So we've picked off four and you'll be given the opportunity to select one and to look at that in much more depth. And after the break, Carla will introduce that. Um, so if I can suggest that we take um, perhaps 10 minutes for a break, if that's okay. So until... Um, Actually, if everyone's OK, maybe six minutes until 10 past, just to give a little bit more time um, after the break. So until 10 past, take a break and then come back and we will introduce the next exercise. And we'll be doing that in small um, breakout groups, probably of between five and 10 people per group. There should be plenty of opportunity to really look in detail at how you could potentially use these transformative outcomes in your work. Start the next exercise shortly. So as you come back into the group um, this time, I'd be grateful if you could turn your cameras on, if possible. Um, and then we can see who's back and then we'll look at moving into the groups to focus on just one of the transformative outcomes. It's also really nice to see everyone with their cameras on. Thank you. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're now going to look at um, using a transformative outcome in your work. And Carla will introduce the purpose of, of this activity. And then Francisco, uh, who's our digital coordinator, will explain um, what you do to select the, the group. Um, each of the groups will be facilitated by people working in Tipsy. So there's also the chance to ask questions and delve a little bit more into the theory. So over to you, Carla, to introduce the activity. Thanks, Vicky. Um, so in this activity, we will dive into four transformative outcomes um, in order to explore how we can use them in uh, projects, programs, or other initiatives. Um, so as Johan said, the value of the theory that we work with the multi-level perspective and uh, the transformative outcomes is that it can be applied to projects and it help us uh, it can help us help you make decisions about um, your activities, your strategy, and so on. So what we want to do is to, uh, you know, kind of bring the theory into like the actual practice uh, with a discussion based on uh, three questions that will help us um, understand better what the outcome means for a specific uh, project or initiative or organization, and how can you work on, on that outcome or through that outcome. Um, we have selected selected four outcomes, and um, actually uh, we're going to use a mirror board so you can take a look at the outcomes already. Uh, but um, just going to give you a bit tour, a bit of a tour because you will be able to select one of these outcomes in the breakout rooms. So we have uh, the first outcome, shielding, uh, which is about um, how do you create a niche, sort of how do you make a niche uh, kind of. Um, yeah, how do you make an idea, of, how do you take an idea uh, to become a niche, something that you can take a, as, a, as something that will lead to a, a, lead a transformation. Um, so this is kind of the basic idea of the MLP. And I definitely recommend this uh, outcome if you're not too familiar with MLP. If you, this is the first time you're encountering the theories, it's really a good outcome to understand the basics. Um, then the second outcome is... Um, expectations. Um, I'm sorry, I forget. And that will be facilitated by Vicky. And the second outcome is uh, navigating expectations. So this is also about the first process. It's about how do we align visions and values and uh, promises and goals of different stakeholders uh, as a, in the process of uh, transforming a system. Um, yeah, this is also that something that Johan mentioned, just uh, answering the question about how do we work with the different stakeholders. And I will be facilitating that room. Um, so you're, if you're interested in imaginaries or if you're interested in uh, anticipation and futures methodologies and how you can use that strategically to achieve certain outcomes, uh, that's, that's the room you should uh, go to. Uh, then we have institutionalization, which is um, how we transform a niche 
um, like kind of an idea with its own practices, its own rules that are different into something a bit um, more stable. So what can we do to, um, yeah, to give um, a sense that this is not temporal, that this will not change, like say with the next government or it will not change with the next crisis, but this is something that will last on a, on a, over a certain time in order to, um, to have a chance to really transform the system. So what can organizations do in order to help niches become institutionalized? And that room will be facilitated by Andrea and Johan. Um, so if you're into, uh, yeah, if you're, you're into the business of like really uh, helping niches to move forward and, and become the new alternative, that's, that's the room you should go to. Well, kind of all the rooms, but especially that one. And then the last one is about changing perceptions of landscape pressures. And I think this is something um, Lipashi mentioned already, um, uh, made a lot of emphasis in her presentation. So one of the things in opening the regime is to understand differently what are opportunities and what are challenges and how we can, um, you know, change our mental models of how we solve problems, not only as uh, individuals, as organizations, but as in terms of systems. So how do we understand differently how, what is quality of uh, food? What is good, what is food or, or what is, uh, how we understand differently what is um, providing good housing and how that changes uh, based on um, different drivers that we can find in the, in the, the oh, sorry, drivers or changes or um, kind of, um, yeah, events that happen externally, how they, help us uh, think differently about the possibilities of change and how this we can use these opportunities in order to uh, promote a change in the larger infrastructure. So a good example is, for instance, how um, Corona helped us finally articulate remote work. And uh, although we've been talking about this for so long, finally we're doing it. So that was a landscape pressure that changed um, a promise, a niche that was remote work into something that established. So if you're really into um, help uh, thinking, um, helping organizations or, or, or helping others to think differently about problems and, and in that way articulate new strategies, that's the niche, uh, the room, sorry, that you should go to. And that would be facilitated by Bipash. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thanks, Carla. And just to let you know how this is going to work. So you'll be offered the chance to go into a breakout room and, and Francisco will explain how that works. Back, um, Francisco, do we have everybody back from all of the groups now or have we still got some? Yep, everybody should be back now. Everyone's back now. That's great. Thanks. Well, welcome back. Um, I think in, in our group, we really enjoyed that discussion and, and hope you did too. Um, if you have any comments, that's the first time that we've tried that particular exercise. And if you have any comments on how much time there was, or if there's anything you would have liked to have done a little bit more of um, specifically about that exercise, you know, do put it in the chat. Um, before we finish, I would just like to um, ask you to go back to the board. Um, so on the Miro board, you'll find that there, if you kind of zoom out using the minus key, uh, you'll find that there's a, an image of a rose on the board. And so we're inviting you in relation to the whole session, um, and that may include the exercise, but also the broader session, to put any thoughts around the flowers as to what was most valuable, um, thorns, anything you didn't like or anything missing, and also the buds in terms of new ideas or, or what you want to learn more about, because we will be doing more sessions on similar themes. I think you can see that now. Thank you, Carla, for sharing sharing your screen. Um, I'll just pause for a moment or two and let you do that now.
Okay, thanks so much for engaging with that. And it, it's still open. You can keep the link going after the session and, and you can add more as you wish. Um, so we just wanted to close uh, on time by saying really thank you so much for joining us today and for taking part in these discussions and these exercises. It's been a really interesting session. And I wanted to thank um, Francisco, our digital coordinator, um, for dealing with the difficulties of getting everyone into rooms. And also um, thank the team at Chipsy. So Carla, Bipashi, Andrea, Johan, um, who have I missed? <laughs> And we've got Geraldine here, Imogen here, we've got a few people from Tipsy here, but thank you all for joining and Chucks. Um, and I wanted to let you know that the Open Learning Series uh, will continue, we'll have another couple of sessions coming up. Uh, one will be on portfolio approaches to transformative innovation policies. And we've also got another one coming up on transformative niches. We may be doing more on transformative outcomes. So if you're not already registered, for the Digital Digest of Tipsy and you want to hear about the future sessions, then please sign up for that on the website and we will send information. They'll be in January, the next sessions. Um, we also have our Tipsy conference taking place in January and um, the programme is now online, so you can see that on the Tipsy website. And if you would like to join, I think registrations, is that right, Geraldine, that registrations will open very soon, that we have programme up, but we're not quite registering yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that, that's all from us. Um, please stay on the line as long as you want. We'll leave the room open and leave as you wish and feel free to engage with the board as you do. Thank you.